one of the challenges that we're seeing, I experienced it, we're seeing in our resetters, is that women love the idea of fasting. This is not a challenge. There is so many miracles that can happen when you fast, but the challenge exists when we don't think about our hormones, when we don't, we don't honor our, specifically our sex hormones. What I really want to emphasize with progesterone is that you make the most progesterone around day 20 of your cycle. All fasts have a little bit of a cortisol spike and we call that a hormetic stress. Hormetic stressors for women do very, are fine in the, in the front half of the cycle, but in the back half, when you need to make progesterone, you don't want a, you don't want cortisol. You don't want a hormetic stress. The best time to do more hormetic, hormetic stressors, more fasting, more burst training would be the first two weeks, first 14 days or so right after the cycle hits. Exactly. Hey Keto Camper, Ben Azadi here, best-selling author of three books, founder of Keto Camp. I'm super excited to welcome back Dr. Mindy Peltz to the Keto Camp podcast. On a previous episode, we talked about how to do keto for the ladies out there, whether you have a monthly cycle or you're postmenopausal. And if you want to watch that interview after this one, you can click the screen right there and watch it next. Today's episode is all about fasting. Fasting for the ladies out there, whether you are having your monthly period, postmenopausal, we break it all down for you. Dr. Minty gets into her fasting circle. This is actually the first time she ever shared this fasting circle concept to the public, and you're gonna hear it and see it right here on this video. She gets into her new book, which is called The Fasting Circle, and she outlines it all for you. First time she shared it, I was excited about that. We also get into the dangers of fasting too much. What are some things to pay attention to, some signs, and how we wanna balance it out with feasting and fasting. And then Dr. Mindy is going to give you a week-by-week -week breakdown on how to do fasting during your monthly cycle. So for the ladies out there who get a period, week one, week two, week three, and week four should be a different schedule, and she'll break that all down for you. And then we get into how to do it if you're post-menopausal. She explains that very well for you. And then we get into the 511 rule, which is my favorite seven day protocol for keto and fasting. And then we dive deep into the six styles of fasting intermittent fasting, autophagy fasting, the gut reset fast, the fat burner fast, the dopamine reset fast, and the immunity fast. We talk about fats that make it harder to fast, the role toxins play with fasting, what to do if you're starting to lose your hair, how to grow the hair back. And then we have an opportunity where we bring on a couple of the members from the Keto Camp Academy who asked Mindy some questions. So you're gonna love this interview. Dr. Mindy is absolutely brilliant. She has a fantastic YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed to that yet, subscribe to her channel. We'll drop a link for that down below. She is a best-selling author, an educator, a speaker, and the podcast host of Resetter Podcast, which is one of the leading science podcasts in the world. She's the author of The Menopause Reset, The Reset Factor, Dr. Mindy is a recognized leader in the alternative health world and is the founder of Family Life Wellness and her local clinic that is made to speed up healing and maximize performance. She is also the founder of the Reset Academy. In her private group, she and her team helps implement the principles of fasting and keto and diet variation into their lives. So let's bring on Dr. Mindy Pouts. Keto campers, oh boy. I'm so excited and super grateful to be here with you today. In a moment, I'm gonna bring on an amazing friend of mine, a mentor of mine. She is shining bright in the health world, and all of you already know who she is. Her name is Dr. Mindy Peltz. She was on the Keto Camp Podcast before, episode 125, where we talked all things keto. The title of that talk was The Woman's Complete Guide to Keto. So if you haven't heard that or watched that video interview, we're going to put the link for it down below for those watching on YouTube and those listening on the podcast. Today's episode is going to be focused around fasting, intermittent fasting, autophagy fasting, dopamine fasting. What is that? In other areas of fasting, she is a pioneer in the health space. She's making huge waves with her resetters community. She has her book, uh, Men Menopause Reset. She's the go-to source for women wanting to do keto fasting, detox, and even guys, because I study her like a scientist. So without further ado, here is my brilliant friend and colleague, Dr. Mindy Peltz. Hey, Mindy. 
Thank you. That was like quite an introduction. Uh, that was impressive. Thank you for having me. I meant every word. You're so brilliant. And I'm so excited personally, selfishly to geek out with you today on fasting. I know we have a lot of the Keto Camp Academy members in the back end. We're going to bring them on a little bit later and we have them on the live stream as well. So for those watching live in the Academy Facebook group, let Mindy and I know where you're watching from so we could see that you're there. Uh, Mindy, let's start with fasting. That's the topic at hand today. Mm -hmm. You have developed a concept. I want to start right here that you were sharing with me over Voxer called the fasting circle. Tell yeah. us about that. So it's like hot off the presses. And I think it warrants sort of uh, a backstory so you can understand like how we got to this place where women need to do fasting differently. Um, one of the challenges that we're seeing, I experienced it, we're seeing in our resetters, is that women love the idea of fasting. This is not a challenge. There is, there, there is so many miracles that can happen when you fast. But the challenge exists when we don't think about our hormones, when we don't, we don't honor our specifically our sex hormones. And what where men and women have to start to separate out their fasting lifestyle is in the category of sex hormones. Men, your sex hormones, your testosterone in a 24 hour period, it's every couple of hours you're getting testosterone. It's coming at you. We get testosterone one time a month and it, you know, it comes and it goes in the front half of our cycle. We've got estrogen coming in the back half of our cycle. We've got progesterone coming. And so we have to fast very differently to be able to meet those ebbs and flows. So I started off the journey of fasting, discovering the bad side of this for myself, <laughs> where I was like, all of a sudden, fasting all the time, loving how it made me feel, and it just tanked my progesterone. So we started to teach our, uh, our resetters. And so, well, I made the modifications first to myself, where I stepped out of fasting the week before my period, and I started to notice that I felt better. But then we started to experiment with all of our resetters and we had a lot of questions, questions like, well, what if I want to lose weight? I don't want to step out of fasting. I don't want to feast. I'm feeling so good. And so I dove in and I looked at a, a 28 day cycle. I'm just going to use that as an example. And I looked at the principles of autophagy. I looked at the studies on gut re uh, repair, the MIT study about how it can reboot intestinal stem cells. I looked at the, where we're getting testosterone and estrogen and progesterone, and I just mapped what I'm seeing in the science to a woman's cycle, and we put it together in something called the fasting circle. And my hope, I'm in the process of writing a book on it right now, and we're going to hopefully bring it to Instagram and to bring it to our community. My hope is it will be like a tool where a woman could go, okay, I'm on day 12 of my cycle. What fasts are okay for me to do? What food do I need to eat? And it can be like a, a help her navigate that fasting experience because women want to fast. That is what I've seen. And the intermittent fasting is powerful, but there's a whole nother level that we can go to if we do it very uh, methodically, if we do it very thoughtfully, um, and are aware of these peaks and valleys of our hormones. Bro, I love the concept. It's it's uh, this is hot off the press because Mindy hasn't even shared this with with no, most of the community. You're my first. <laughs> yeah, so the keto cameras get access to this now, and I can't wait to see how you put this in the book and put it into the content that you create. So, what are some of the dangers? Let's talk about the dangers, some of the negative effects of women who fast too much. Yeah. Okay. So first danger is progesterone. And um, what I really want to emphasize with progesterone is that you make the most progesterone around day 20 of your cycle. So if you are in an extremely, um, and it's not just fasting, if you are in a low glycemic state, you're not leaning into carbs during this time, you're doing long fasts, like a three-day water fast, this would be the worst time to do a three-day water fast. Day 20, the, the seven Day days 20, or so yeah. leading to a period, okay. Yeah, and the reason for it is that your body needs to make, if it makes cortisol, 
it won't make progesterone very efficiently. And all fasts have a little bit of a cortisol spike, and we call that a hormetic stress. Hormetic stressors for women do very are fine in the in the front half of the cycle, but in the back half, when you need to make progesterone, you don't want to you don't want cortisol. You don't want a hormetic stress. So day twenty is the first pitfall, and it's the most simple to understand, which is step out of fasting. If you, if you, I get a lot of women, they're like, I can't, I can't, I love it. I can't step out. And so I say, okay, 13 hours max, no more than 13 hours. And then you got to step out of keto and you got to lean into uh, squashes and beans, potatoes. Uh, we're even experimenting a little bit with the carnivore. I know you've done the carnivore diet. Like we're experimenting a little bit to see where carnivore might fit into this. Um, but you've got to build progesterone. And if you don't, what will happen is you'll start missing your cycle. How many, and you, I know you've seen this, like how many women report back to you that they go, they start fasting and doing keto and all of a sudden they lose their, their cycle. Like, yeah. Happens often. Often. Or they start spotting or their hair starts thinning or mm -hmm. they, their heart starts racing um, uh, for me, my indicator was I had so much anxiety building up in my body. I couldn't relax because I was missing that progesterone. So the first pitfall is day 20. It is the and one you got to watch for. So you said hormetic stressors are not a good idea to have during that time, the, the last, uh, the seven days leading up to the period. So day 20 or so, would that include strength training, burst training, high intensity yeah. exercise? Yeah. Yeah. So you can kind of like see where I'm going with this. So is that every hormetic stressor, including work stress, uh, mm. socializing, like there, we don't have enough of a conversation around women and this moment in our cycle. And we've got to chill out. So we're best sitting on the couch and like doing yoga or or slowing life down. And I always say, you don't want to sit on the couch and eat pizza and ice cream, but you do want to slow down and honor that your body is trying to make progesterone. Now, if you throw a perimenopausal woman into that, she's already losing so much progesterone. So holy cow, like that's a big, a, a big monumental moment in a woman's cycle. And we've got to adapt our lifestyle for it. So that means the best time to do more hormetic, hormetic stressors, more fasting, more burst training would be the first two weeks, first 14 days or so right after the cycle hits. Exactly. So then if we go to the front half of our cycle, day one through about day 10, um, we've got, we're building estrogen at this point. And the one I think of estrogen, I think of insulin resistance if you are insulin resistant, you will struggle to build estrogen. So if you, the best time to get yourself insulin sensitive is from day one to day 10. And I'm, and these are generalizations. We, we're going to um, really make some modifications for people who have like PCOS and yeah. um, for uh, women who maybe are on a, like an IUD where they don't have a cycle. So we're working on all those modifications, but day one to day 10, is the time period when, yeah, you could do a three-day water fast. You could, um, you really want to go keto. You want to make yourself insulin sensitive during that time. Now, if you're somebody who you know when you ovulate, like you are like on it, you know it exactly, great. You might ovulate on day 12 and you can go all the way. You can keep your keto and fasting all the way to day 12. But we, we're finding day one to day 10 you want to make yourself insulin sensitive. You want to use the principles of fasting, use the principles of keto to bring insulin sensitivity back again, which is totally opposite than day 20. Yeah. Well, that because the hormones are cyclical and the body is always adapting and, and you're going with the body, not against it. That's why I love it because it's actually human physiology that it's ingrained into our DNA. Right. It's, it's, it's brilliant. So that's for the cycling women, the women who have their monthly cycle and perimenopausal woman. What about the postmenopausal woman? Yeah. Okay. So this is also really interesting. Um, and I write about this in the menopause reset. If you are over 40, I want you to understand that you literally have an organ that's shutting down. It's called your ovaries. 
And it's weird when you stop and you think about it like that, like no other time in your life, unless you have an organ removed, will you have an organ shutting down? So what is the, what do the ovaries do for us? They make estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Well, they've got to, your body still has to make some of that. So what it does is it hands over the job to your adrenal glands. So women, as they move through menopause, have more adrenal stress. Now, what I see is that when you get to post-menopause, if you are still having uh, symptoms, hot flashes, I've heard so many women that are like five years into menopause, they're still insulin resistant, they're still having hot flashes, they're still waking up at night. If that is still you, then you've got to go back and correct the lifestyle. So you don't have a cycle that you've got to think about, but what we're going to, what we've been doing is just using more of like the 511 principle, but I'm pretty excited about the fasting circle as a, as a possibility for a postmenopausal woman to go through times where she is really low keto. She does her 24, 36, 48 hour fasts. And she does that maybe for a couple of weeks. And then she steps out of that does intermittent fasting with some uh, like carnivore. She could do carnivore. Then she could step back into low keto and then she could step out and do progesterone building, hormone building, because we are not made to be permanent fat burners. I cannot emphasize this enough. I'm with you. We are made for metabolic switching. So I we as uh, as women get on the other side of menopause, we've got to go through periods where we're building our hormones back up and we've got to go through periods where we're training our body to be a fat burner. And what I've seen is as long as you do that, what ends up happening is you are you all your menopause symptoms will go away. I even see women that will report, oh, my God, I started bleeding again and I haven't been bleeding for five years. Wow. And all it is, is you're just balancing those hormones out. I, I recently learned that the ovaries has the highest concentration of mitochondria, up to 100,000 mitochondria in a cell yeah. of the ovaries. That blew my mind. And uh, uh, do you, I, I was searching for the answer. What about for guys? What's the highest concentration? Is it the gonads for, for men? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Me I neither. Think- yeah, I recently learned that too, that it's we're really looking at the um, ovaries having so many mitochondria. What I had always heard is the eyes and the prefrontal mm. cortex have the most amount of mitochondria. So mm. when we look at things like macular degeneration and cataracts, you're really looking at, at well, okay, let's look at insulin control. Let's look at detox. When we're looking at symptoms like um, anxiety and depression, or, or memory loss or areas that we're getting locked in our midbrain. Is it possible that the prefrontal cortex needs some more uh, lifestyle changes? It needs more fasting, it needs more detox. So it would make sense that the, the areas that have the most mitochondria need these principles the most. Yeah, absolutely. The ovaries, reproduction, the gonads, reproduction, the eyes for survival, the the prefrontal cortex for decision-making, survival. So it would make sense. And then that's fascinating because, yeah, the mitochondria is is so important. And if you could support the mitochondria by stressing it with all these adaptation principles that Mindy is speaking about, then the mitochondria that are strong get stronger. The mitochondria that are weak get get replenished and destroyed. And, And that's what's happening. And that is the philosophy here. It is the adaptation. You mentioned, uh, Dr. Mitty, you mentioned the 511 protocol. I, I speak about it often. I know we learned it both from our, our mentor, yeah. Dr. Pompa, but some people don't know what that is. So what is that 511 rule? Yeah, so 511, the simple, the easiest way to explain it is five days of intermittent fasting and keto, and then one day extend your fast. Go. I like to get people to 24 because there's some great, I, I find that's just an incredible fast for repairing any kind of gut issue. And you could do a keto meal that night. Uh, you could do carnivore. You can, you know, there's a lot of options for that. And then one day a week, no fasting, and you actually want to feast. And I know you teach this as well. I think it's really, really profound that we are meant for metabolic switching. 
We are not meant to be permanent fat burners. And yes, we love ketones. Yes, we love fat burning. But we want to switch in and out. And I I think for women, it's like this, we get the best of all worlds because we're we have to force ourselves to go into these hormone building times. And in the hormone building times, that's when we can lean into foods like squashes and potatoes and beans and uh, some like quinoa. And then if you do that at the right time, then you can go into keto and become very insulin sensitive. So you never get bored. You feel completely free to, to move in and out. Um, I, I know when you first learn these principles, it's a little scary, but um once you get the hang of it, it's just, a, it's a beautiful way to approach your food and fasting. It is. And it's, and it's sustainable because look, I, I love keto. I know you do too. I mean, my company's called Keto Camp. However, we're not dogmatic about it. We understand the history of humans. We understand how the physiology works, but there are a lot of keto organizations and conferences that, that teach keto and they do a great job at teaching it, but they teach you to stay in keto live keto, you're going to be in keto for the rest of your life, and sugar is the mm-hmm. devil, carbs are the devil, when that's not necessarily true. The, the goal is this metabolic freedom, mm-hmm. being able to oh, metabolically devil. switch back and forth, with, which is what Dr. Mindy is speaking about here. Uh, I do want to get, by the way, I love, don't you just love Dr. Mindy's energy, everybody who's watching and listening <laughs> to She's hi- hyping me up here. <laughs> I, I want to get into- talking about this. I, I know you do. I, yeah. want, I just, like, I just want people to understand this because- I hear like, I hear women shouldn't fast. Women shouldn't do keto. I hear women should only stick to intermittent fasting um, and not do it every day. And all the hours I've spent looking at the science, applying it to myself, applying it to uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of female resetters, miracles, people off medication, people overcoming memory loss, people losing 70, 100 pounds, people like, you know, reversing conditions left and right. Women should not be left out of that equation. Mm -hmm. And if we dismiss the power of keto and and fasting for women and don't give women tools, we are not we are leaving them out of the self healing conversation. And that Mm -hmm. is not okay in my book. Uh, Amen. There's three principles to healing. Identify interference remove interference, let the body heal. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, I see the keto campers, they're super excited. Love, you see Sylvia, love her energy. I don't know if you see the comments right there. No, Mindy. how do I see it? Okay. It oh, should be on the screen. Oh, yeah, there you go. I just found them. <laughs> yeah, so they're saying, love it, love your energy. She's love awesome, it. she's Thank the you. best. Everybody's enjoying you. Uh, I wanna bring up a, a, a graphic here. It was actually one of your, um, it was an Instagram post. Let me see Uh-oh. if I can get her up here. Uh, <laughs> It was this. You talked about the six yeah. styles of fasting. And if you could break down and go as deep as you want into these six styles of fasting. Yeah. Look at I love how techie you are, Ben. I got, <laughs> I'm going to have to learn a few things from you. Um, okay. So this is, we've experimented in our resetter community. We do a different fast every month and we've experimented with a lot of different concepts. And um, I, to make it as simple as possible, I like to look at fasting like a light dimmer switch. So whereas the more you fast, you're amping up more healing power. So at 13 hours, most people know the intermittent fasting, you start the switch gets turned on. So you turn the light on, you're starting the switch. And at 13 hours, there's incredible research. Um, One of the best studies done on women in 13, between 13 and 15 hours was done on women recovering from breast cancer. And they found that there was a 70% uh, um, chance of not getting breast cancer again if women did 13 to 15 hours every single day of fasting. Now, as a woman who doesn't have breast cancer, When I hear that statistic, and by the way, this was not a study done on mice or men. This was a a meta-analysis on women, and it was a large size group. Do you remember where it was, where it was published? Yeah. um, Gosh, the person who first told me about it was Nasha Winters. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll get the link for you because I just, I put it in the new book for women to see. Okay, we'll put it in the notes. Thank you, Mindy. Yeah, uh-huh. So the first thing to, to realize in that is you could look at that and you could go, oh, 
well, I don't have breast cancer. Why would I want to do that? But what was it that was going on in the cells at that 13 to 15 hours that made the reoccurrence of breast cancer go down so dramatically? And it's really that you are starting to amp up mitochondrial health, like we're talking about. You are getting, as your body makes ketones, ketones go into those mitochondria and they power them up. And you're also at 13 to 15 hours bringing inflammation down. So now we're like, we're in the ballpark of healing. And um, all you did is 13 to 15 hours. So that's very doable. I, yeah. I actually, what's really cool about that study was I have a patient who has um, breast cancer and she was asked by Kaiser to go to a nutrition class. And I like, I kind of warned her. I was like, eh, I don't know what's going to happen at that nutrition class. Cause <laughs> usually they teach them like, just eat whatever you want. She came back and said they, they cited that study. Wow. And they told them, all, yeah, they told them all the intermittent fast. So so anyway, so that's that is uh, 13 to 15 hours. There is some research or some, I should say, maybe urban myths saying that uh, you get growth hormone. Like I've heard 1300% increase in growth hormone at 13, at 13 to 15 hours. I have not found good science on that. Have you, have you found that? I, I well, saw not, not at 13 to 15 hours. I saw an, during a 24 hour fast, I saw 1300% huh. in, in women and 20, and then 2000% in men. There we go. Okay. So there we go. We can add that in. I'll put that into my, my gut reset. So, so, right. anyway, so as you move along the dial, as the dial gets amped up at about 17 hours, autophagy starts. So I want to point this out because we get this debate all the time in our resetter community. Autophagy starts. I'm not saying you are at max autophagy. I am saying autophagy kicks in. Yeah. And autophagy will continue. It the the word in the in the, in the health world is that it will peak at about 72 hours. But it starts at 17 hours, and which means that the cell starts to understand that it needs to clean its act up. It's got any pathogens, any viruses, any bacteria. They've got to get in. The intelligence inside the cell has to get those pathogens out. And in that process, the other thing that it will do is it will look around the cell and see if there's any injured body, any injured cellular parts. So not body parts, but cellular parts. <laughs> so you've got like endoplastic reticulum, you've got mitochondria, you've got DNA. I mean, there's so much going on inside the cell. And at 17 hours, you turn on an intelligence that starts to clean that cell up. So we think of this as the detox fast. It's great. It's good for, for detox, but it's the beginning of it. I just want to point that out. Yeah. And so, it's also that that's the average, right? So for somebody who does, uh, if they're doing, doing like fasted exercise, they might achieve that faster for somebody who is still metabolically damaged and they have their glycogen stores full when they go into the fast, it might take a little bit longer. So it's, there's a lot of variables here, but 17 hours is the, is the average where it starts. So that's brilliantly yeah. put Mindy. Yeah. So I, it, uh, we spent, believe me, Ben, we spent like weeks debating the science and the resetters. And so <laughs> I finally was like, I think I'm going to be a little more mindful about how I phrase this so that people understand. Because, you know, it's so interesting in the world of nutrition, we want absolutes. It yeah. would be way easier for me to sit up here and tell you, do this, don't do this. But especially when we're working with women, no, there's no absolutes. There's, it, there's an ebb and flow that we've got to find with these fasts. So anyways, so that's 17. At 24 hours, it, the science, this was done on mice. I just want to point out where we know where which science was done. MIT research showed that at 24 hours, you started to get a, a, a surge of intestinal stem cells. Mm. This is an incredible fast for those of you that have SIBO, candida, um, any kind of gut dysbiosis, Throwing some 24-hour fasts into the picture is so healing. And I'm I'm sure you've seen this too, Ben, that um, I, I mean, we've tried coming at gut health from so many different angles. And the 24-hour fast mixed with heavy metal detoxing, like 
Those two will repattern the whole internal mucosal membrane of the intestine and, and help you get over those hurdles with any kind of gut problems. Yeah, so true. It's it's a one-two punch to really heal the gut. And and let's face it, most people, most Americans and most people that live in first world countries, they have a leaky gut. They have a destroyed gut. They I, I was interviewing Dr. Zach Bush, who I know you're fond of. You do work with him as well. Him. And he, he, he shared that they did a study at the University of Virginia and they wanted to track how long it took to process food, not even to exit the colon, but to enter the small intestine. And they took these college students, college students, younger, faster digestion. So keep that in mind. And they gave them 800 calories of, of pizza, mellow mushroom pizza. And they tracked to see how long it would take to just enter the small intestine. And it took 14 hours on average, 14 hours. So if somebody, and most Americans are not fasting for 14 hours. So you create this backlog you, and it creates acid reflux, bloating, fatigue. And the analogy that I always give Mindy is it's like a corporate worker who works nine to five. Let's call her Sandra. Hopefully Sandra's not watching or listening. I'm not talking about you, Sandra, <laughs> <laughs> but Sandra works nine to five. She puts in eight hours of really, really good work. And then she's walking to her car. She's exhausted. She's ready to go home and just rest, watch some Netflix, read a book. And then she's entering her car and then she gets a phone call from her boss. Sandra, we need you to come back in for five mm -hmm. hours to work on a project. So she goes back in. So imagine this happening over and over and over for days and weeks and, and even months. Sandra would be destroyed. Well, our gut is similar to Sandra. When we keep giving it well, food, right. we don't allow it to take a break. Then we're going to get these di digestive issues. So what Dr. Mindy here is saying, when you fast, it's one of the best ways to reset Dr. Mindy's yeah. word, reset the gut. And this study showed in, in mice that you can do that with a 24 hour fast. Yeah. And I just want to point out the mice studies I, that be beautifully said, I love that analogy. And, Thank you. Um, one thing I want to point out about the mice studies is yes, we as women need to demand more studies done on women in fasting, but the mice studies get us in the ballpark. So it's easy to dismiss some of those, but at least it gets us in the ballpark. Now we need to look at the application of these principles. And this is what's been so fun about my resetters is we've been able to see, you know, it, these principles work and gut, the gut reset one works almost every time on SIBO. Like if we start mm. getting women um, and men into these 24 hour fasts, it repairs, it repairs SIBO like nobody's business. And, and SIBO, if you're not familiar with that, it's small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, which a lot of people have, especially if you get bloated after cruciferous vegetables, uh, you might have SIBO. Uh, so continue. You were talking about the 24 okay, hour so gut reset. Yeah. So that's 24 hours. Um, now, if you continue on, I feel like the 36 hour fast is really the one where you start to access your stored glucose um, it, that has been stored in fat. And this was, you know, um, Jason Fung really brought this to our attention that if we wanted to lose weight, we had to look at this scenario that we have this stored food in the freezer. And that if you want to access the stored food in the freezer, you got to empty the stores in the in your refrigerator and then force yourself to go to the freezer. Well, what I'm finding with a lot of people is that it really takes a consistent 36 hours to go access that stored glucose in the freezer. And you're also accessing um, toxins. Your body really starts to break down fat more efficiently at 36 hours. And but Mindy, reason, but Mindy, the, the JAMA study showed that you can't lose weight with fasting. <laughs> yeah, who was it done on? That's what I want to know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can revisit that a little bit later. Continue. Yeah, right. I, you, there was actually a really cool study um, recently from a guy out of Stanford. It got a lot of press that intermittent fasting wasn't a good tool for losing weight. And I dove into the study and the study was done on a small group and it, the, it was like 20 people. And it was done on everything from men who were 18 years old to women that were 65. And they were tracked over a three to six month period. And it said that um, that, that they didn't lose any weight, that no, nobody lost weight. And so they were like, this isn't a great tool. Well, there was a couple of things they didn't, they didn't take into factor. One is they didn't control what they ate. So they mm -hmm. just gave them the parameters, go intermittent fast. They didn't control the calories that they were eating. So to me, that's already a problem. 
Second thing is that they looked at women uh, or men that were 19 and women that were 60. Okay, you should never, ever, when it comes to weight loss, compare a 60-year-old woman to a 19-year-old boy. So uh, um, these studies, you have to dive into the nuances and it, it sucks, but we have to not, we, we've become a soundbite culture. We just read the headlines and we don't dig deeper. Like we read the headlines, women shouldn't fast. You don't dig deeper and start mm -hmm. to look at that. Yeah, it's so true. So, so important. And I love how you empower your community to understand that, to understand, hey, don't fall for the headline. Let's look at the study. Let's look at the method. A lot of the, the headlines are used for propaganda. You know, there's, if, if, if you could put fasting into a pill, the, <laughs> the study would have shown something differently because it would the be- The headlines would be different. Totally yeah. different. It'll be a multi, multi billion dollar industry, but fasting is free. A lot of companies will lose money. They'll, their profits will take a hit. So it's so important to understand that. I want to briefly interrupt this amazing interview with Dr. Mindy. I mean, her energy is just contagious, isn't it? To just say thank you for making this point to the video. If you haven't hit the thumbs up button on this video yet and you're getting value, please hit the thumbs up button. If you're brand new to the Keto Camp YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button with the little bell so you're notified when we release a brand new video. We also go live here on the channel every Wednesday where I actually answer your questions for you. And then take a, a moment here to check out the links down below for our episode sponsors, Purity Coffee, which is the best keto coffee in the world, and then Pure Form, which is the healthiest alternative to rancid fish oil. We have links in coupon codes for you down below. They help get the content out there and they make a great product. So let's get back to the conversation with Dr. Mindy Peltz. Yeah, I felt that way when I first learned Dr. Osumi's, uh, what, what he won the Nobel Prize on. Yeah. I When I dove into that, I'm like, why is nobody talking about this? And then it hit me. Oh, nobody's going to get rich off of telling people to not eat and get off your medication. You've taken two of the biggest industries out of the picture, big pharma and big, and big food, as, as Asprey likes to call it. So... It's so true. Yeah, yeah, have to keep that in mind. Yeah, so important. So that's the 36. Oh, I didn't mean to take you out of there. Uh, okay. That's the 36 hour fast where you actually tap into stored glycogen, stored sugars. Continue yeah. with what you were saying there. Okay, so then you move along and the 48 hour fast. Now, this is one I don't think people talk about enough, and I really want to emphasize it. So there's two really interesting things that happen here. One, just like we become insulin resistant from too much dopamine, we lose our sensitivity, I'm sorry, from insulin, we lose our sensitivity to dopamine. And we are getting so much dopamine right now. We're getting it from um, instant access. I mean, we can sit at home and grab our phone and order food and it comes to the front door. That's a dopamine rush. We can binge watch our favorite Netflix series. That's a dopamine rush. Watch Dr. Access. Mindy on YouTube over and over. You can, over. Binge, watch <laughs> you can binge, watch, binge watch me on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, so we are becoming uh, desensitized to dopamine. Uh, eating all day long, it will make it so that our dopamine uh, receptor sites are getting blocked too much. So we've got to make ourselves more sensitive. And um, one of the ways of doing that is pulling food out of the equation. What I love about the 48 hour fast and what the science is showing in the 48 hour fast is that you not only resensitize these receptor sites to dopamine, but that you actually create some new receptor sites for dopamine. Oh, that's so, cool. Really cool. I can give you the science on that as yeah. well. So, um, and we, uh, Dave Asprey and I geeked out on this when I brought him on the Resetter podcast. And he, the way, I love the way he explains it. He's like, I kind of thought of it like a sea anemone, like, you know, I don't, you know, the sea anemones, how they like, you touch them and they go, they shrink Oh yeah, up. right, yeah. Yeah, and so what I think happens at the 48 hour fast is it opens and all, like all of a sudden those receptor sites are like ready to grab dopamine. So your appreciation of food, your appreciation of life, your happiness level goes up. And I don't know about you, but I find a 48 hour fast pretty doable. Yeah. And you know, you're saying just water, right? When you talk about the 36 hours or 48 hours, let's, yeah. let's make, let's get that clear. You're just saying water and sea salt, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
that's best. Now let's give it a little, let's give it a little caveat. So okay. if people are like, oh man, I could use that happiness, but I don't want it. What makes me unhappy is not drinking my cup of coffee. There, there needs to be some flexibility with all of these principles. We need to give ourselves some grace and know that when we're talking about science, they didn't give coffee to, to the mice. They didn't give coffee to the women who were post recovery of, uh, you know, from breast cancer. So when they do these studies, they don't get when we're trying to mimic those same results. They didn't, there was no coffee. There was no bulletproof coffee. There was no yeah. peak tea. So yeah. but all of those other tools have really helped us be able to create what I call a fasting lifestyle. And that's really the goal. Yeah, I, I uh, heard a stat. I think it was from David Asardo, who's both of our marketing coach and friend. I think he was the one who shared it. But the average American scrolls on their phone uh, enough time throughout one day to climb the Empire State Building. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that is like a dopamine hit every few seconds. Yeah. So right. I'll, I'll just share real quick some things I do to kind of reset my dopamine receptors. Yes, a 48-hour fast, that is very powerful. And I, I recommend that as well. And for ladies, it'll be done during that first two weeks once the cycle hits, going back to Mindy's point. Um, but things that I do is the first uh, hour and a half when I wake up, I'm not checking my phone, I'm not checking emails. I'm going for walks. I'm sprinkling in, sprinkling in time on my rooftop to just be in my thoughts and, and, and stretch a little bit. So those are ways to kind of also reset and open up those receptor sites to become more sensitive. Do you do things similar to that throughout your day? Yeah. I, I, I try. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mindy, Mindy, the word try is a bad word here at Keto I know Camp. It is. I, I, I always say trying is failure with honor. So we either yes. do it or we don't do it. Yes. Um, I'm aware that I need to do it more and, I, <laughs> yeah. and I'm working on that. So um, I, what I do is go through periods. So like Sunday, you know, the morning half of Sunday, I'm not checking my phone. Um, yes, in my morning hour, not checking the phone. Um, and it's there, there's a lot of distraction and a lot of dopamine opportunities in today's world. Um, so for me, I've got to like leave the house and really get out into nature and just totally unplug that way. Yeah, I love seeing your fo your photos when you're hiking and out, out and about. So let's continue here. We were le we left off with the um, dopamine reset. Anything else you want to add to that before we go to the immunity well, part? No, the other really interesting one, and I didn't put it in there, but it's worth talking about, is that at 48 hours, um, and this was a human study, um, they have found that there is something that gets stimulated in the Krebs cycle that makes your Krebs cycle spit out more antioxidants. And specifically what it spits out are antioxidants that are needed to slow the aging process down. Hmm. So it could, the 48 hour fast could also be like an anti-aging fast. Um, but uh, you know, there's, I, I think a lot of people use that 48 hour fast as the dopamine hit, you know, as to reset dopamine, but it's worth pointing out. Yeah, great. That's interesting. So now you have the 72 hour immunity fast. Tell us about that. Yeah. Okay. So this is Walter Longo's studies. And the immunity fast is where he found he took people, if you're not familiar with it, he took people through a um, 30, uh, 72 hour fast. And he found that intestinal re, uh, stem cells were rebooted, specifically when it comes to white blood cells. Um, and it was specifically done on people going through chemotherapy. So it was done on cancer patients. But what it's been known as in the world of fasting is the, the immunity reboot and, the, and a way to kill cancer cells, to become more efficient at fighting cancer cells. Um, so keeping that in mind, I think, is, is important. Um, I'll tell you where I've used it, and many of our resetters have used it. I'm curious if, if you've seen this as well. I find any kind of random musculoskeletal injury that is not healing, if you throw a 72-hour uh, fast at it, you really can heal musculoskeletal injuries. Um, the, the most personal example that I'll use of that is I had a uh, Achilles tendon injury that I tried everything that to try to fix and nothing was working. 
And so I just gave it a five day water fast and it literally, my Achilles was buzzing for about two months afterwards. Like there was like something had turned on inside there and the, it completely healed, never has come back ever. That, and that's that was, amazing. Yeah. That was two years ago. Wow. That's a perfect example of the, the innate intelligence doing right. its job. I, I remember when I did my five day water fast. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had this lower back pain on day three, four, and five, and I used to always pull out my back, and it was that autophagy pain that was healing that area. Um, yeah. That's interesting. So if you're dealing with some musculoskeletal pain right now, could be a good idea for you to do a 72-hour fast because as Mindy yeah. shared earlier, that's when the uh, autophagy starts to peak and yeah. you get the stem cells. Uh, anything else you want to add to that before we move on to a different topic here? Yeah, no, those are kind of the basic. I mean, you've got other fasts that I know that the fasting world talks about. Um, I don't talk about them a lot, but they're worth maybe on this conversation chatting about dry fasting. Um, so, oh, uh, Mindy, by, by the way, before you share about that, I got I got to share something real quick. I was on a I was on a uh, a clubhouse a, a couple of days ago doing a, a fasting talk, and I had a medical doctor. I also had Doctor Ste Stephanie Estima, who's brilliant. You got to connect with her. And okay. they were both saying how they would never recommend a dry fast. And they were going on about how extreme it is. Well, it, I agree. It's very extreme. But I had to chime in and say, well, I actually think it could be beneficial if you do it the right way. And I explained how I did it. We did it with some of the members. So yeah. I, I'm with you. Continue with how you do it and some of the benefits yeah. of who should well, try it. You, you know what is the best explanation to them is look at, look at Muslims during Ramadan. They dry mm -hmm. fast. And what they do is they eat when the when it's dark, so before sunup, they eat and have their drink, a coffee, tea, whatever they're they're doing. Then they dry fast all day long, and then they eat again when the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. So twelve hours of dry fasting like this, thirty days in a row, will spike BDNF in the brain, which is like a brain fertilizer that makes it so that you can hold on to information, you can remember things better. Um, so that would be the first thing. The second thing with this group, and the one that I think is the most interesting, is a 14-hour dry fast where you, again, done on Muslims during Ramadan, and it was sun up to sundown. For, same thing. They ate in the morning, drank in the morning, but then went 14 hours without food or water. And they found that it turned on, and I forget how many, it was like turned on like 30 helpful genes like wow. genes that help with breaking down fat, help with metabol metabolizing glucose. And it turned off like 10 cancer genes. Wow. So that, but it was done 30 days in a row. So um, it doesn't really fit necessarily in a woman's cycle. Um, there is great research on women and this dry type of dry fasting, but it's not like a one-off fast. You have to really, to get that result, you got to do it for 30 days. That is well-documented. So when doctors are saying that's not, that's not great, they don't, they're not looking at the science. That, you know, my mom is, um, my mom does that. She's Muslim. She practices that every year. And I remember when I was a kid, I used to always think like, what are you doing, mom? That's so unhealthy for you. How could you fast without drinking water? And I used to get on her case. Now I'm like, oh, I'm so glad my mom still does that. It's so healthy for her. Like, keep doing it, mom. Right. I support you. And, and I would argue this, pretty much everybody dry fast every night when they're sleeping, right? Six, eight hours or however long we sleep for. Right. So you're right. just extend, extending that a little bit. Um, okay. And then I want to talk about something that's also very important. You made a post about it. I'm not going to pull up that slide. But you see, the post was titled "Fats That Will Make It Hard to Fast." What are the fats, and why does it make it hard to fast when you consume these during your eating window? So, the, my new way of explaining this is: most people, when they come to fasting, come from the standard American diet. Let's just sort of put that into perspective. And in the standard American diet, most people are insulin resistant. And I think there, the statistic that came around in 2020 is only 12% 12, 12 of Americans are metabolically fit, meaning wow. metabolically fit is code for insulin sensitive. So we've got what? That leaves us uh, 82, 80, 88% of Americans that are, are insulin resistant. Well, the number one thing that makes you insulin resistant isn't sugar, it's fat. It's your bad fats. So it's your uh, canola oils, your cottonseed oils, your 
um, corn oil, your partially hydrogenated soybean, safflower, sunflower, vegetable. They're everything you find in your market. They're everything you find at your fast food restaurant. So the problem that we have is the goal of fasting is to get you out of insulin resistance. And in order to do that, we are trying to stress the cell. And if the cell is all jumped up with those bad fats, now it, you're going to make your fasting efforts harder. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be much, it's like, uh, again, I keep, I know you and I both have interviewed Dave Asprey and he has, has his new book out. So, but you know, his enemy of fasting is kale yeah. and I, and I laugh at that and I'm like, okay, I can kind of go with you there. But I think the enemy to fasting are these bad oils. And because what will happen is you go into a fasted state and then you can't, it's like hard to switch in and out because the oils are keeping you stuck in insulin resistance. So it just makes, it makes hard to get ketones, makes it hard to move in and out of fast. So it's a, it's one we really need to be mindful of. Yeah, so true, especially in the keto world. And we talk about that often. The, in Brian Peskin's book, The PEO Solution, he had a study called the Iowa study in there. And it was looking at fish oil, which is one of the bad fats as well. Uh, unstable, not as bad as these vegetable oils that we're speaking about, but still very unstable. And he showed in the study after they removed the fish oil, it took 132 days to actually have the cell membranes yeah. go back to functioning normal. That's four and a half months. And then I actually emailed him, Mindy. I'm like, so if that's for fish oil, what do you think it is for these vegetable oils? And he said, well, it's closer to a year for the vegetable oils. And I was like, wow, that means if you just remove all the vegetable oils like today, none of them in your diet anymore, it'll take about a year to go back to functioning normal at the cellular membrane level. And he's like, yeah, that's about right. And then I, yeah. and I asked him the question about comparing these fats that you've mentioned, the bad fats, to smoking cigarettes. And he said, on average, the, somebody who smokes two packs of cigarettes every single day for up to 28 years, their chances of developing lung cancer within those 28 years was about 16%, one six. Then he said, if you compare that to somebody who eats these rancid fats, the, the oils that you just mentioned every single day for up to 28 years, their chances of developing cancer or heart disease was 86%. And I interviewed Nasha Win uh, not Nasha Winters, uh, Dr. Kate Shanahan, who wrote uh, Deep Nutrition, Fat Burn Fix. And I, says, does, I asked her, does your research line up with what Brian Peskin said, the 86%? And she said, well, actually, it's closer to 100%. Wow. wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And the, you know where I geek out on that? Why aren't we talking about this? Yeah. You know, like we well, we have, are. Well, we are. But I mean, as a, as a culture, like... There's so many urban myths around food. Like recently, you know, I don't get this question as much anymore, but I get a lot of people that go, but wait, isn't breakfast the most important meal of the day? Okay, let's unpack that sentence for a second. What, where did breakfast is the most important meal of the day come from? It was a marketing gimmick by Kellogg's to promote cornflakes. So I have dove into the research trying to find that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I can't find it on PubMed anywhere, but I can find a lot of articles, you know, tying breakfast is the most important day to Kellogg's uh, marketing. Yeah. This hat, we have to, I feel like we got to flip nutrition inside out because we're not getting the right information. Oh, so true. And you know what? Breakfast could be the most important meal of the day, but it doesn't have to be in the morning. It could be at 3 p.m. It could be at 5 p.m. And how you, how you break the fast is important, but I know what you're saying. Absolutely. We've been regurgitated these lies. There's a lot of money to be made from it. And the opposite is a lot of money to be to be lost when you're practicing fasting and skipping breakfast. When I do my, when I do my webinars, I always show the... Um, the audience that look, if you just skipped breakfast Monday through Friday for a year, you would save on average $3,900 a, a year and you yeah. would get back four and a half days. <laughs> like what can you do with four and a half days and about $4,000 just by skipping breakfast? And, and that's just Monday through Friday. You could still feast and have your, your feast day on the weekends. Yeah. Um, well, I wanna... this, is, this is just, I just want to point out, this is why I don't want to leave women out of the conversation of fasting because there's money to be saved, there's medications to be prevented or maybe possibly given, you can get off of them. There's neurons to repair, repair in your brain, there's mm -hmm. weight loss to lose. And if women think intermittent fasting is the only solution, 
Um, we're not getting the whole complete picture, but we do have to time it to our cycle. And once you figure this out, there's, it's, it's becomes this lifestyle that serves you not only health wise, but it serves you financial wise. It serves you in preventing diseases. Like it is an amazing tool that just needs to be done, sharpened a little different for women. Yeah, so true. And it really is a burden off your shoulders when you don't have to rely on when is my next snack coming? When is my next yeah. meal coming? You could be doing your work. You could be productive. You could be tra traveling on an airplane. For example, I had a really busy day today. It's 3.57 p.m. here in Miami. I haven't eaten anything today. I didn't plan on it, but I have metabolic freedom and I feel fantastic. And I'll eat actually around 6 p.m. when I'm done with work here. And that's totally fine. I'm a male, so I could do more of that than a female, but yeah, I feel you. good. <laughs> lucky me. <laughs> My girlfriend says that to me all the time. Yeah. Um, okay. I want to talk about one more enemy of fasting. Before I do, we're going to, in, in a little bit, we're going to bring on some of the Academy members. I know Leslie's back there. They're, so Amy, Dempsey, Katie, and Anne, I don't see you in the studio. So if you're watching on the live stream, I'm going to post the link and anybody else, we, we might have time for you to join. I'm going to post the StreamYard link. Maybe you could join and ask Dr. Mindy and myself your question. So I just posted that link there. Once you join, I'll see you in the studio. Okay. You mentioned kale being the enemy of fasting, or actually Dave asked reset that, and you mentioned also the vegetable oils. There's one more thing, and, and that's toxins. Because when yeah. we have toxins, and you talk about this all the time, when toxins enter the body from eating, breathing on our skin, the number one priority for the body is survival, and it'll activate the PPARY pathway to take those toxins away from vital organs to our fat cells. Now we're doing fasting. We're doing these strategies that Mindy just brilliantly broke up, uh, broke down for us, and we're shrinking fat cells. We're releasing fat cells. We could do that, but we can't do that with toxins. So what is the role of somebody who has a lot of toxins and they practice fasting? What are some of the problems that could happen, and what is the solution for that problem? Yeah, that's yeah, a great question. We need about three more hours to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> you said you had no time constraints, so let's go. <laughs> Maybe you're right. That six hour window may have been I right. I told you, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, the first thing that I want to point out, especially if you're doing a lot of fasting and you're losing weight, think of your fat stores as a place that your body stores excess. So when you start to lose weight, especially with fasting, you're going to get these toxins that get released into your system. This is why variation is key, because nobody should detox all the time. We need to go in and out of different forms of detox. So the first thing is, if you know your toxic load may be high, I really encourage you to vary your fast. The 511 we talked about would be great. Um, if you follow when we when we get the fasting circle out, um, then you you know you're already doing variation within a, a month period. With the detox effect of fasting, the first thing to know is don't fear it. Use things like variation. Use things like activated charcoal. Bind is what I love. Um, I don't know if you if you have any other true carbon cleanse. I know some people use. Um, so just be aware of it. But what I see with people is this, this idea that you have to avoid fasting because you got a rash or you got a, the keto flu. I, although I don't hear as much about the keto flu anymore, but some people feel like you get the keto flu or uh, you get constipated or you get diarrhea or um, you get brain fog. What I would love to do is just let's, let's honor those symptoms and let's learn how to read them. And the, the reason that this is so important is that in our allopathic model of health, we are taught that symptoms are bad. But when you're using a tool like fasting, what you're doing is you're tapping into an intelligence that is going to heal you. And in that healing, symptoms are going to appear. And some of those symptoms are detox symptoms and they're not to be feared, they're, they're to be interpreted. And you gotta look at what it is. So a couple of great ideas is make sure as you're fasting, you're opening up your detox pathways. Are you increasing your circulation? Um, are you sweating? You can use infrared saunas if you have an infrared sauna. 
You can use a rebounder and and um, just jump up and down on a rebounding uh, uh, trampoline. I know you've had Kelly Kennedy on, who is the mm -hmm. lymph expert. She's got some great protocols for you know using massaging different parts of your body to move lymph. So don't fear the detox symptoms. Work with them. And then the last part, and I and I think this might have been part of your original question, is the more toxins you have, the harder it may be to be fat, get fat adapted, the harder it may be to get ketones. So just be mindful if you're one of those people that you're not getting into ketosis as efficiently, as easy as you, as you want, keep working the principles. And then in the back of your mind, you might want to realize that there may be a high toxic load that needs to be addressed. Mm. Well said. And I know you were brilliant even when I wasn't watching. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for keeping things in order here. I don't know what happened to my computer. It yeah. just all of a sudden shut down, but I'm back with you. Um, yeah, toxins. I mean, we do live in the most toxic world and they're everywhere from silver fillings to our food supply, our water supply. So it's important to understand that this is happening and then also understand that not all detoxes are created equal. You have the, the cleanses and the enemas yeah. and all that is terrific, but that's working downstream. Then you got to go upstream if you really want to get well. Like Dr. Yeah. Pompa says, you got to fix the cell. So I know you and I, we, we learn a lot about detox. We run these detox programs. I'm running one coming up soon where I'm going to lead it. Uh, awesome. And then I know that you're doing one as well. Uh, what about, I know there's a, there's a comment here before I bring on uh, our Leslie is going to be the first one. There was a comment here about um, Cindy who says hair loss. You know, what about hair loss? When you get do keto yeah. and fasting, what are some things you could help the, to do to help the hair grow back and thicker and better than ever before? Yeah. Okay, uh, perfect. So the first thing I just wanna put is, is again, you're gonna see that the solution to all of your fasting challenges is variation. I'm gonna just say it again, cause it's really worth pointing out. You were not meant to be a permanent fat burner. You were meant to be a metabolic switcher. So you're meant to go in and out. So if you've been doing a lot of fasting and your hair is falling out, you need to add in some feast days. You need to stop fasting for a little while and then come back to it. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is, um, and I, this really became apparent to me when we started fasting hundreds and thousands of people every month in our community, is that we are, most of us are already operating from a place of mineral deficiency. Our soils are depleted. If you're not familiar with regenerative agriculture, um, if you're not familiar with the movie Kiss the Ground, highly recommend you go and check mm. it out. But our soils are not giving us the same mineral content and the same burst of mineral um, uh, amounts as they did 10, 20, 30 years ago. And this is because they are monocropped. They are heavily sprayed. That's a whole nother podcast uh, that, to be a discussion. I actually just interviewed the guy, uh, the head of uh, Rodell Institute, Jeff Tack. If you haven't introduced, uh, interviewed him, I, I'm going to make a connection for yeah, you. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And he's on a mission to regenerate soils. He's actually come up with a new certification that we can look at on, on our packaged food in the market that will let us know if it came from a regenerative farm, which is really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. I love that. So I would say operate. If you're going to start to build a fasting lifestyle, especially if you're going into a longer fast, just operate from the place that you're mineral deficient. You're probably mineral deficient. But then if you get and, and add minerals back in, so we're experimenting with a ton of different minerals. I know you have a great mineral supplement that you like. Um, we're still tr trying them all out and seeing what we think. But if you're going to fast, you need mineral supplementation. I will tell you that um, in my bottle right now are packets of minerals. I'm drinking minerals all day long. So that would be the second thing. And then the third thing is for women especially is hair loss. When you're fasting, hair loss in general can be a thyroid issue. So as I'm sure you've taught your community, there are close to 11 different things to look at. When you look at the thyroid, it's not as simple as looking at TSH. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're diving into understanding your thyroid health, um, because if you go into the fasting lifestyle already with a uh, deficient thyroid, um, you're going to want to supplement your fasting lifestyle with some things that will build your thyroid up. Mm, so good. And that goes back to the 
toxic conversation, the toxin conversation. When yeah. you have mercury specifically, it blocks selenium. Selenium helps support the thyroid. So everything that we speak about here is this multi-therapeutic approach. Um, okay. I want to take this time now to bring on some of the Keto Camp Academy members. We'll do Leslie and then we'll do uh, Katie afterwards. So Leslie, are you ready to go? Give me the thumbs up down there if you're ready to go. Okay. So they're going to ask you questions and you're going to be able to coach them here on the call. So, hey, Leslie. Oh, I can see them. I love this. <laughs> How's it going, Dr. Mandy? Thank you so much for having us today. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Nice to meet you. So my question is, and I actually commented, I think, on your Instagram page when you posted this, but the how to calculate your glucose ketone index. And, okay. and so with that, I've been experimenting with the carnivore diet, and I wanted to see how long is too long to stay in, say, high ketosis or therapeutic ketosis. Oh, okay. That's a great question. And there's a lot of things in there. So the first thing that I always say to people is let's look at what you're trying to accomplish. So for the longest time, I did not teach GKI. And the reason for that is that we can get obsessed about our ketones and our blood sugar. And really the GKI is a phenomenal index for people who have a chronic condition like, um, like cancer. You know, if there was a cancer diagnosis to overcome, then you actually would want to stay and get your GKI down low for a, a period of time. If that's not you, then I really think that when we're looking at these high states of ketosis and low blood sugar, we're looking at around, and this is not based off research, this is just based off of what I see with my resetters, you're looking at about 80% of your time being in that fat adapted place and 20% of your time coming out of it and being a sugar burner. So that would equate to, you know, two major meals a week, you would want to step out or one day, this is why I like the 511. On that one feast day, you're trying to step out of ketosis, which will destroy your GKI. So now carnivore may, may still, you know, carnivore is a form of keto. So you've got to make sure that you are leaning into some foods that pull you out. Now for women, I really like women to lean into the squashes. And if you look at the principles of carnivore and the low toxic um, vegetables and plants that do best for somebody on a carnivore, um, the squashes are great. Avocado is great. Cucumbers are great. Berries are good. Some of the fruits are good. Mangoes are even considered to be a low toxic food. Now, somebody in a keto world is like a mango, like, no, no, don't give me a mango. And yet one day a week, adding those in, stepping out of ketosis, but staying within the principles of the low toxic plants can not only help any autoimmune condition, help your gut, but it will make it so that you are more metabolically flexible. Okay. Thank you so much. Is that, is that helpful? That is so helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Great question, Leslie. I love that you're taking notes. I love that you have the question. So kudos to you. And uh, it was good to see you, Leslie. Thank you. Okay. Let's bring on Katie, who is, I see her lovely red hair. Hey, Katie, good to see you. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Hi, Mindy. Dr. Mindy. I'm a nice. big fan. Uh, oh, you know, I jumped you. at this. I jumped at this chance. I always appreciate your videos and when you give us our checklist. Love it. Uh, yeah. yeah. And the science. So I just want to give you real briefly about myself. I grew up overeating. I was almost a hundred pounds heavier than I am now. Um, over the years, I cut back, you know, the typical way, the low fat portions. But then, you know, ever since I found Ben, I try to do intermittent, not try, he teaches me, don't say try, <laughs> uh, intermittent fasting. And I usually will fast, I would say like 16 hours a day. I feel that I'm not overeating, but I'm not dropping the weight. So I started thinking about it and just researching, maybe perhaps it would be something to do with my gut. So I know that earlier you mentioned about 24 hour fast. Um, I've seen you mention gut zoomer. So did Ben. Do you think that would be a good place for me to start? And my second question, uh, do you think diversity in the food is more important than um, 
the, the, the quality of the food, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure, but I think maybe that's, that's where I'm stuck. stuck. Yeah. Okay. So my first question to you is, are you doing 16 hours all the time or do you ever switch in and out of that? I switch in and out based on my schedule. So some days I'm 16, some days I'm 18, 19, but I would say in general, 16. Okay. Do you ever, not, do you ever not fast? Uh, yeah, I would say sometimes on like a Sunday. Okay. So the first step, and this is going to be the hardest one, is I would like take a day and not fast. I would eat breakfast. You, you've got to mix it up for your body. And the best uh, uh, explanation that I can give of that is it would be like if you and I were living in a cabin together in the winter and they just dumped off a bunch of firewood and we looked outside and we're like, oh, my God, we have enough for months and months and months. And we just kept burning firewood and burning firewood. And then one day we look out there and there's not enough firewood. We're going to slow down our burning of that firewood to be able to make it through the winter. Your body's doing the same thing. If you're fasting 16 hours over and over and over again, and you're not stepping, eating breakfast every once in a while and stepping out, your metabolism will get in a bit of a stuck spot. So one okay. day a week, you've got to feast. Now, let's be responsible with how we feast. So as a woman, I would tell you, we're always fighting for progesterone. So I love leaning into the progesterone foods. So can you, you know, can you do the squashes? Can you do potatoes? Um, do it on a weekend because you're going to discover you're not going to be as productive as you normally are when you eat a big okay. breakfast. But I would eat breakfast. I would lean into hormone building foods. I like Sunday because it's kind of my chill day. And then Monday's my busy day. So okay. then I can go right back into fasting on Monday. But you're going to need to step out a little bit. So okay. and extending the fast is going to be good too. 24 hours, 36 hours, throw some of those in there. So if 16 is your go to, we've got to have some that are longer. And we've got to have some days where we're not doing it. So that we're we're like putting that hormetic stress on the body so that it forces itself to drop that extra pounds that you're looking for or to get you into that extra state of ketosis that you're you're looking for. Can I so ask you, do you have any fast. suggestions in terms of being able to increase the fast? Like if mm -hmm. in your mind you don't, you know, you're not used to doing it. I mean, I've done a 24 hour, yeah. but you, you understand what I'm saying. I do. So fat, lean into fat. So it's okay to have a, have a teaspoon of um, MCT oil or have a cup of coffee with MCT oil. Um, if you want to have um, an avocado, have an avocado. Uh, I'm really, I love Andrea's seed oils. It's a concentrated oil. I'll put a little five seed oil. It's not the toxic oil. And I'll, and I'll have a scoop of seed oil. Sometimes I literally take a spoon and take a scoop of ghee. And I just put a scoop of ghee in my mouth. So okay. fat is going to keep your blood sugar stable and it's going to elongate your fast, and especially the way you're trying to approach fasting. So okay. don't be scared to lean into that in the beginning. I appreciate it. Yeah. And then the, on the diversity issue, this is a really good one. So I, we have run thousands of gut zoomers on people and I have yet to see one person. Maybe I've seen, let me take that back. I may have seen one person who had good gut diversity. Oh, we wow. are missing our gut diversity. We have over 6,000 different species of bacteria in our gut. And each one of those bacteria are doing something different. They're preventing autoimmune conditions. They're giving us serotonin. They're boosting our immune system. They're helping us make GABA. I mean, there's so many different things that our gut bacteria do. So before you do a gut zoomer, what I would do is actually stick with your good quality because processed foods, glyphosate, pesticides, those are going to destroy those bacteria. Antibiotic rich meat, they're going to destroy those bacteria. So the first step was keep your quality, but increase your diversity. So what this looks like, if you eat blueberries all the time, how about you switch over to raspberries? If you are buying the same container of lettuce at the market all day, every time, what about 
you you buy some romaine lettuce. Like we need to look or you know where I use this a lot. My husband and I started looking at like, okay, we love grass fed beef and we love chicken. Well, could we try goat? goat? What about duck? What about Cornish game hams? Like uh, bison? Like we're just constantly mixing the food that we eat. And I, I think most Americans are stuck in a rut. And that's why we have such little diversity. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. I wrote down the tips. I'm going to start it this weekend. Awesome. Uh, action taker. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Awesome. Can, that was... Hey Ben, I can see that I said the three letter the three letter word on your on your podcast, the the tri word. You got yeah. I'm, I obviously have some mindset work to do. <laughs> I still catch myself saying it sometimes, and I, I'm, I'm aware. I'll, 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 I'll close it down. I'll shut it down real fast. So, yeah. Uh, I'll ask you a few questions here in the chat box, and then we'll, we'll land the plane on this amazing interview. Um, so we have N, who is part of the Academy, who says, The Carnivore Diet, what book do you recommend for us as a resource? Ah, oh, okay. I love this question. Um I think that there are a lot of different resources. I love the carnivore co code if you need to prove to yourself that carnivore is the path to go. He, Paul Saladino, he, not only is he an amazing man with a beautiful heart and a brilliant brain, but he has over 600 research articles in there really discussing the benefits of carnivore. So I think that sometimes when we go to make food changes, we need the knowledge in order to stick to the change. So if that's you, then I would get Carnivore Code. Now, the most applicable book, in my opinion, is Maria Emmerich's The Carnivore Cookbook. What I love about her book is that it's got all these recipes, but in the front part of the cookbook is an explanation of carnivore that's very easy to read. Like you can pick the book up and you can just read it really quick and then you have all those recipes. So to me, those two combined are a powerful um, duo for really setting your course um, effectively with Carnivore. Yeah, great feedback. I love both those books. And and you have access to the Academy portal. I have a 30-day protocol in there for you where I break down the four levels. So you could use that as a tool as well and read those books as well because they're really good books. Cindy, says, what if I don't have know when my cycle is because I've had an ablation yeah. years ago? Yeah. Well, so here's what I got to tell you, Cindy, is once the fasting circle comes out, I'm just going to have people go through from day one to day 30 if they don't know their cycle and just follow it because it has enough variation that you'll be able to move in and out. And so follow my Instagram. That will be the first place we we're working on a visual right now. That will be the first place that it goes. Now, having said that, what you can do that's the most simple and not to complicate anything, let's let's go back to the 511. So five days a week, we're doing keto and intermittent fasting. One day a week, we're elongating our, our fast, maybe getting to a 24 hour fast. Dinner um, to dinner, lunch to lunch sort of deal. Yeah, go to keto. And then one day a week, you're doing hormone building. So you're leaning and you're not fasting. I think that routine is really good. If you know you struggle with low progesterone, like you're not sleeping well, um, you're, I, I don't know if Cindy's past menopause or not, but maybe you're in the middle where you're, uh, where you do get, I don't know if you ever get a cycle, but um, a lot of times we've got to bring progesterone back up. If you have a lot of anxiety, um, if you're concerned about estrogen dominance, then you're going to want to lean into more progesterone building days and you might throw two feast days in a week, especially if you're not worried about a lot of weight loss. Awesome answer. I love it. So uh, last question here before we wrap this up, electrolytes. So they were, I think, I think they were confused about us saying water only is the best way to do it. Electrolytes are great, but, and you could add to what you think here, Mindy, but if it has like sweeteners in it, then it might push your body towards a certain direction and might spike glucose, start the digestive process. So what are your thoughts on electrolytes? Yeah, I, I think we need them. I think we definitely need them. Um, but you got to be careful on the quality of them. Uh, because, you know, even uh, I'm wearing, uh, I know you wore for a while a CGM. Yeah. So I'm wearing one and I had um, these little chocolate treats, like Lily's chocolate treats with mm -hmm. stevia in them the other day, spiked my blood sugar. 
Mm. So we have to be mindful that the urethritol, the monk fruits, the stevias that can be found in some of these electrolyte um, drinks can still spike blood sugar. That's okay if you're like not trying to, to lose weight or you, you know, you, you're not trying to overcome a serious condition with keto and fasting. Those little spikes, as long as it comes back down, will be fine. But if you're really trying to, um, you have a focus on a condition that you're trying to use these principles for, you might want to look at making sure that these electrolytes don't have stevia and all that in. Um, and having said that, I think we all need electrolytes back to the, to mm -hmm. the regenerative agriculture. We all need electrolytes. What is your blood glucose right now? Let's take a look. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> okay. Oh, that would be interesting. Okay. Let's do it. Cause you, we got all excited here. I know when yeah, I used to check right? mine during okay, interview, well, it used to go up. And by um, the way, for those, for those watching real quick, um, put in the, the chat box, if you, what was your aha takeaway from this and show Mindy some love so I could show your comments on screen for her. Okay, so here's what I'm going to tell you about my blood, my um, my blood glucose. Okay, for starters, it didn't do anything. I am happy to be here, but it didn't do anything. It's all in the eighties. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. It's oh, that's great! Great numbers right there. Yeah. So, um, but here's what I'm going to tell you. I've learned from, and I'm wearing NutriSense. That's the one I'm learning. I'm wearing. Yeah, awesome. it's been it's pretty much been in the eighties for like three days. Um, so carnivore. Oh my God, Maria, Maria Emmerich taught me how to make a mozzarella stick carnivore style. You take mm. a mozzarella piece of cheese, you wrap it in with hamburger, and then you wrap bacon around that. Mm. Okay, it was huge. I ate it and my blood sugar dropped. Interesting. So, wow. So my body loves carnivore. It loves protein. Second thing, and I and I ran this past uh, Carrie Jones because I'm like, this is amazing. But there's a little asterisk here. Okay. When I drink when I drink a glass of wine, my blood sugar drops into the 60s or the 70s. So that kind of tells me that stress is definitely a promoter of elevated blood sugar for me. So hmm. I was like, well. Then should I just drink dry farm wine all the time? <laughs> no, that. Is not my solution. <laughs> should I justify it, huh? <laughs> yeah. And she uh, she laughed. She's like, no, you still have to detox the wine through your liver. I'm like, okay, fine, fine. So, <laughs> but but I love um, I love to know what it what my lifestyle is doing to my blood sugar, which is why these things are great. And sometimes excitement, sometimes stress can raise your, your, uh, blood sugar and you don't even realize it. Mm. So. Yeah. So fascinating. I love, I love the idea of wearing a CGM. I, I wore it for 60 days straight. It gave me some really good feedback yeah. here. Here are some, I, look at the screen. I'm going to put some comments for you, Dr. Mindy. Look at the okay. love you got here. You have Bridget. Thanks for the great interview. You have uh, it just says Facebook user. So I'm not sure who it is, but such a fan of Dr. Mindy going to do not try going to do the 511. <laughs> Kira, uh, thank you so much, Ben and Dr. Mindy. Aha moment is to build up the hormones post fast, such as progesterone. Great. Aha. Uh, sounds like a dream meal talking about the carnivore meal yeah. you explained. Uh, thank you, Mindy. So lucky to be part of uh, learning from you. Awesome. Alina, who's on the Keto Camp team, I love how she broke down the benefits of fasting by the specific hours. Amazing conversation. Uh, Leslie, who j joined with us earlier, was says uh, her takeaways was 511 metabolic switching. Doing, I've been doing AFF with Lions Diet all month. I'll do this next. We'll eliminate trying. Awesome. <laughs> um, Bay Area in the house. Okay, that's by, by Dr. Yeah, Mindy right Powell. by me. That's awesome. What's the name of your clinic, Mindy? It's Family Life Wellness uh, Center, and we have a biohacking center. So we've got a lot of cool biohacking tools. So come see us. Yeah, come see her. And Dr. Mindy and myself, I'm just going to keep going through these comments. Dr. Mindy and myself are, these are dopamine hits for you. <laughs> dopamine hits all over. <laughs> Dr. Mindy and myself will be speaking at um, the Biohacking Congress together in Silicon yeah. Valley. Yeah. So that's in the Bay Area. We would love to see you all there. I'll put links and resources for you to get tickets down below. Okay. I want to acknowledge you for this amazing conversation. I learned so much. I always do when I speak to you and your energy is contagious. I love the work that you're doing. I'm grateful to call you a mentor, a friend, a colleague, and I'm excited to learn more about the Fasting Circle book and just all the work that you're doing. You know, I'm not a female. I'm not a woman. 
but I study you to see how women should be doing this because I have a lot of women in the academy. Of course, my girlfriend's a woman. So I get so much from you and I'm always giving you credit. And I just want to say thank you, Dr. Mindy, for your amazing work, for always showing up, even when you don't feel like it. And I want you to take this opportunity to share with the with the podcast, the Keto Camp podcast listeners and watchers, where's the best place to check you out and some other links and resources for them. Yeah. Well, let me start off by just saying thank you. I mean, I... I you, I think those of us that are doing this because we want to change the course of health for humanity, we we spot each other and we <laughs> connect with that. each yeah. other. So, so the feeling is very is mutual. Um, and you. then I also just want to say to the women in the group that the fasting circle is something that we as women have needed to apply our feast famine cycling for a very long time. So I, I am so excited to get this out to you. It is my gift to you. I want us all to apply it. I want us all to make sure that we're using fasting to our best advantage. So I can't wait to get it out to the world. Me and too. Uh, where people find me, um, my the menopause reset, those of you that are over 40, um, the menopause reset is a five step process. One of those steps is fasting variations that I use to really help my hormonal, um, swings as I went through menopause. So that comes out in print on, in April 6th. So you can go to Amazon and pre-order it. Um, that would be amazing. And then YouTube, I'm like you, Ben, you can go <laughs> find me on YouTube and we're putting out fasting videos a couple times a week. And then, of course, my website. So, um, but we're everywhere, like you. We're on Instagram. You can Clubhouse. fast. You can what? You can fast with us once a month. We have a free five day fasting experience. Um, so, yeah, you can. I, it's not hard to find me. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would say for sure. Subscribe to her YouTube channel and her Instagram. They're putting out some great, consistent content. We'll put links for Dr. Mindy and the notes of the podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, we'll put the, the links down below for her. Go show her some love. Let her know that you um, watch this. Let's take a quick photo here live on the interview so I can oh post my God, on my, oh, on I my Instagram. Are you going to send it to me? I'll send it to you. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Let me put this backwards. I love it. Yay. Oh, wait. I did a video. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> Got it. I'll send it to you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mindy. I know that the Academy members appreciate you. And then those who are going to listen to this in the future appreciate you as well. Can't wait to see you in March. Agreed. And, uh, it's going to be it's awesome. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you, Ben. And keep up the amazing work you're doing. So we'll just keep shouting louder. Eventually, they're going <laughs> to hear us. I know they're going to hear us. We just got to well, keep shouting. I really hope you enjoyed that amazing conversation with Dr. Mindy Peltz. Go pre-order her book. Go check out her YouTube channel. All the resources can be found in the video notes down below. And then also hit the thumbs up button on this video if you got any value from it. Text it to a friend, post it on social media. This is the information that every single woman needs to hear. So you can be doing somebody a favor and really helping them out by sending them this video interview. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. If you wanna go watch the previous interview I did with Dr. Mindy Peltz where we talked about how to apply keto for women, you could watch that right now. We could just stick or tap the screen right there, watch that interview. We had a fun time on that interview as well, and I'll see you in that next video.